I went to his BA, his BA honours at um, ANU in Canberra and worked on Tolaki from southeast and Sulawesi in Indonesia. And um, he's just submitted his PhD dissertation, uh, supervised by Mark Donoghue. So in Australia, we don't have a, uh, they don't have, I should say, they don't have a, um, a system of uh, viva like in the UK. So you don't actually have to defend your dissertation. You simply sent off and the examiners do with it what they will. So Owen's in the precarious situation of waiting to hear what the examiners think. But in the meantime, he has a uh, endeavor um, postdoctoral grant to do some field work, more field work in uh, Timor. And um, he'll also be doing some work in um, uh, in the, the, uh, the Netherlands with on language contact between Austronesian and non-Austronesian with Marianne Klamer. Um, he's published on uh, several topics, historical reconstruction and um, Engano, which is a really interesting language, spoken on the barrier islands uh, just off Sumatra in, um, in Indonesia. So. We're lucky to have him here today. Those of us who've come <laughs> shall hear about Mathetasis yes, yes. Timor. Yeah, so um, I don't know what the title was when I sent it out, but this was ended up being the title of my thesis, this rather grandiose sort of title. Uh, so if you're feeling inspired or terrified by the end of the seminar, hopefully that will be online somewhere in a, in a couple of... I don't know, hopefully not too long, a month or so. Yeah, so I'm talking about uh, metathesis in Amurasi, which is a language of Timor. Oops, I'll just use this keyboard. Um, so, first of all, so this is the structure of my talk. Introduction, language background, what is metathesis? Uh, then I'll describe the structure of metathesis, uh, because more things than just metathesis occur. Then the functions, and we can identify sort of three distinct uh, uses of metathesis in Amurasi. There's one instance where it's completely phonologically conditioned and completely predictable. Then in the syntax. ...as well, so it sort of goes from the phonology, a bit higher to syntax, all the way to the discourse. And then I've got some conclusions metathesis within linguistics and then some more so that sort of sort of general linguistics conclusion then a more some more Timor specific conclusions uh, metathesis and identity and linking it to sort of the whole culture of the area I end up with this rather sort of as I was sort of getting to the end of my thesis my conclusion was becoming sort of esoteric and I was feeling as though I was making it up, but when I presented a version of this at ANU, everyone thought, okay. So anyway, let's get started with the introduction. So metathesis is when two segments of a word uh, change positions. This is some data from Rotuman in the Pacific. It's sort of one of the most famous cases of synchronic metathesis. So um, nearly every word has two forms, and depending on the vowels and consonants, these forms are formed by metathesis, so pure, puer. There's some other complications as well, so like if you have high vowels you can get um, umlaut, so a word like, um, uh, what's the example, like, like furi becomes fur. Um, and this has a, a morphological function in Rotuman. It's linked with definiteness and number. I can't remember the exact details, but one of these is like definite plural and the other is indefinite plural. Now most sort of descriptions of metathesis are focused on the, the phonology because it's sort of is strange and it presents challenges for, for models of phonology. Um, and there's been lots of good phonological work done. But one of the sort of central points of my thesis is that in Amurasi at least we need more than phonology to understand metathesis. So where is Amurasi? 
It's on the island of Timor. It's part of this Wub Meto cluster, also known as Darwan. Uh, Timorese, I think Bob Lust calls it Atoni. And Amarasi is at the, the sort of southeastern end. It's a sort of, it's like a language dialect cluster, sort of like, you know, German or Romance or something, although maybe not as diverse. So here's Amarasi, and I worked in a village called Nekmese, which is, I think, about there. Um, it's got about two main dialects, but I won't go into that. I'm just presenting on from the one dialect. So first of all, the structure of metathesis. What happens? Um, before we can sort of talk about what happens, we need to know some basic phonological facts about Amarasi. Uh, 13 consonants, 5 vowels. These voiced obstruents, J and Gwa, they have a limited distribution. Um, they occur in loan words and also in sort of specific morphophonological environments, which I'll get to later in the presentation. Um, and we have very constrained word shapes. So, you know, uh, most words are two syllables. I think in my current database, about 67% of words, in fact, are two syllables. Um, so here's fatu, rock. If you've done anything on Austronesian, you'll recognize this. Um, and all vowel initial words begin with an obligatory glottal stop. So, ume, house. We also have uh, word final consonants, mu'it, animal, and about 43% of words in my database end with a consonant. So, that's pretty common. We can have sequences of two vowels, like kwan, village, that's also quite common. Um, we can also specifically have this sort of diphthong, which I've written here, um, only in stressed syllables. So we get nautus. Otherwise, sequences of two vowels are always form two syllables. Um, so specifically in stressed syllables, we can get this diphthong. And it can be of a number of vowel qualities, but not just any old vowels. Uh, we have consonant clusters as well. Ra'um, meaning ratten. This is, this is fun, coming from southeast Sulawesi, where everything was consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel. I enjoyed that. And those are also quite common. About a quarter of words begin with a consonant cluster. And we can have words of three syllables and four syllables. Four syllables is about the maximum. And nearly all four-syllable words are probably hysteric compounds. So based on this data, we can say that the structure of an Amarasi word is something like this. We've got a foot. Then we've got, which is all optional, then we've got uh, two, two vowels, which are obligatory. The penultimate one is stressed. Um, and we've got an obligatory initial consonant. If there's not one specified, we get the glottal stop, like in the word for house. Um, and then we've got some optional consonants. Part of my analysis is to propose that actually, this isn't the structure of an Amarasi word but all feet are obligatorily consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel, consonant. And when we don't have consonants specified, um, we have empty, empty C slots. So they're sort of null consonants. Um, so now I can talk about the form of metathesis. I'm going to refer to the two forms, the unmetathesized form and the metathesized form, as the U form and the M form, because more than just metathesis takes place. With our words that end in vowel, consonant, vowel, we get consonant, vowel, metathesis. So fatu becomes faut. And this is regular, no matter what the vowels are. Uh, if we've got two identical vowels, we also get metathesis. Words which end in a consonant uh, have metathesis, and their final consonant is deleted. Now, if you'll remember from our word structures, well, you won't because I didn't say it. We have no final consonant clusters. Uh, so this we can analyze as being metathesis. Then we get a word final consonant cluster, which isn't allowed. So you resolve that by deleting the final consonant. We have some vowel assimilation. So mid-vowels get raised to high after the high vowel, after metathesis. Again, in Amarasi, we have no sequences of a high vowel followed by a mid-vowel. So this is also can be analyzed as a straightforward 
um, you know, phonological repair. Some other varieties of Wabmeto do allow Wem, but not Amarasi. We have uh, assimilation of the vowel A, uh, and this only occurs after metathesis. So Nuka, we get metathesis, and then that A uh, assimilates. We have sequences of of vowel plus a in, in U forms, but not in M forms. So this is a, a derived environment effect. You have one rule which operates and that triggers another rule. Uh, words which have a diphthong, they form the M form by deleting the final vowel. Um, again, we can analyze this as straightforward phonological repair. You get metathesis, then you've got three vowels, which isn't allowed, so you delete the third vowel. If we've got a diphthong and a final consonant, then we delete the final consonant and vowel. Again, this is straightforward. The sort of most disturbing form is our forms that end in a vowel sequence and a consonant. They form the M form by just deleting the final consonant. There's no surface reason why this should be the case. Kaut is a perfectly good word, as you can see by faut, and there's no, there's no apparent reason why that should happen. Um, yeah, and for the sake of completeness, words that end in a vowel sequence don't distinguish uh, between the U form and the M form. If metathesis involves copying a vowel, then there is no vowel in seven. Copying a vowel, like, what, what do you mean? Well, if you're switching the position of the vowel and... And the consonant. There's no vowel to switch, so... Yeah, but still, why, from, the, from a surface sort of point of view, why does that final consonant get deleted? Sort of, like, you've got a morphological paradigm to fill. These ones can't do metathesis, so they need to do something. Now, I analyze this as underlyingly metathesis of an empty consonant, but, yeah... Um, so yeah, so we can analyze all these forms by proposing that actually, underlyingly, they're all consonant vowel, consonant vowel, and then these get metathesized and any final consonant clusters get deleted. So how does this, how does this work? Well, here are our simplest examples. We've got mu'it, kaut, fatu, and ai, uh, and I'm going to fill these empty consonants with this null sign just to sort of make it explicit that they behave identically to other consonants. Then we have metathesis taking place. Now we've got a final consonant cluster, which isn't allowed, so we delete that final consonant and we've got our M forms. So that's the sort of, oh, we've got a few more complications. We've got this R assimilation, which only happens in M forms. Uh, so we get metathesis, and then the features of the stressed vowel spread. Uh, and we can sort of explain the reason this, why this happens by uh, the fact that A is a sort of featureless vowel in Amarasi. It's also an epithetic vowel, so we can say that it's minus high, minus front, minus everything. And so then after metathesis, it's just sort of got no features to sort of stand against the, the spread of the stressed vowel. In other varieties of Wabmeto, all vowels assimilate after metathesis. In Amarasi, it's just, just A. And then we delete our final consonant, but that is, is no surface effect. Our words with a diphthong, uh, the same thing happens. We have consonant vowel to vowel consonant metathesis. Now we've got a sequence of three vowels, which isn't allowed, so that third vowel gets deleted. The others shuffle across, and then we delete the final consonant and we've got our M form. So the big generalization that allows us to sort of describe all the different M forms is this obligatory consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel, consonant, foot. Every word has that structure, and when you don't have a, a surface consonant, um, it's just empty, but it behaves in the same way as though there were a consonant there. So where does metathesis occur? What are its functions? There's one instance of phonological metathesis, which is what I'll start off with. So we have a number of vowel initial enclitics in Amarasi, um, and whenever these attach to a clitic host, 
that host obligatorily, obligatorily occurs in the M form. Um, now these enclitics form a phonological word with the host, stress sort of remains on the host, uh, but syntactically they, they form their own uh, uh, independent syntactic head. So for instance this determiner is the head of a determiner phrase and the noun to which it attaches to is the head of a noun phrase. So there's this mismatch between the syntactic and phonological structures which explains some of the processes. Now some of the forms are a bit different before vowel initial enclitics. This form is the same, we have assimilation of R, but word final consonants survive because they're no longer uh, after metathesis, that consonant cluster isn't word final, so no problem. Similarly, um, for a word with a diphthong and a final consonant, that consonant survives. These words undergo no difference. Um, vowel final words, we have a consonant appearing. We have consonant insertion. So a word for Paul, we get nije. And this is the environment in which the j and the gwa occur. Now which consonant is inserted is phonologically conditioned. After front vowels, we get j. After back vowels, we get gwa. Um, so this is, you know, you know, this is phonologically natural. After back-rounded vowels, you get a back-rounded consonant. After palatal or front vowels, you get a palatal consonant. When the, the vowels of a word are of, a different, of different qualities, then we get consonant insertion, and the vowel which conditions insertion of the consonant then assimilates to the quality of the previous vowel. Okay? So, I, fire, R, J. And this is regular, so depend, no matter what the vowels are, oe, water, oje, kiu, kigwe, au, agwe. And so the contrast between lime and fire before a vowel initial enclitic is maintained, but it's moved off the vowel to the consonant. And there's a bit of collapse here because a word which ended in a, uh, a U would be pronounced identically. Okay? Uh, when words end in a vowel and a consonant, we get the final vowel, conditioning insertion of a consonant. Then we get uh, metathesis, and then the vowel, which conditioned insertion of the consonant, assimilating. Okay? So, so fafi, fafje, ume, umje, so on and so forth. Um, yeah. So this is kind of disturbing. Uh, but surprisingly straightforward to analyze once you know how it works. I mean, I spent you know, three years figuring this stuff out. So we've got three, three processes before vowel initial enclitics. We've got consonant insertion, we've got metathesis, we've got vowel assimilation. And I propose that all of these are analyzable as due to automatic phonological, um, uh, as automatic phonological processes of the specific environment in which they occur before a vowel initial enclitic. So first of all, consonant insertion. If we take a word like ume, house, this is the sort of structure, we attach our enclitic. Now consonant insertion happens because morphemes need an onset consonant. This is a common constraint cross-linguistically. You want to begin with a consonant. So we've got these two morphemes, neither of them begin with a consonant. The word initially, we get a glottal stop. So the default word initial consonant is the glottal stop. Word medially, uh, we get our consonant by vowel features spreading. So the coronal features, the front features of this vowel spread, we get a J. And now both our morphemes have an initial consonant. should say also that I'm analyzing these consonants as ambisyllabic. So it's both the uh, coda of the previous syllable and the onset of the following syllable. Metathesis occurs um, because we want to separate um, the, the two morphemes. It's a crisp edge constraint. At the moment, this consonant is shared between both the clitic host and the enclitic. It's a fuzzy border. Uh, that's not so preferred. And so the way we get rid of that fuzzy border is, is by metathesis. 
So metathesis occurs. Now we've got two consonants in that, uh, two final consonants in that syllable, which is not a good syllable structure. So that final one delinks, and we've got a crisp edge. It's clear where the clitic host uh, ends and where the clitic begins. So metathesis sort of happens to push the final consonant of the clitic host into the enclitic. And vowel assimilation, I analyze as occurring because of metathesis. So metathesis has happened, and now the features that are shared between the vowel and this consonant, the, we've got lines crossing. They're shared across the intervening consonant. And lines crossing is sort of the cardinal sin of linguistics in syntax, phonology, everything. So the way we deal with this is by delinking that, that final vowel. Now we have an empty vowel slot into which that stressed vowel then spreads. Um, and we're done. So I'll illustrate with another example. This one's got no surface consonants, but every single empty C slot I play, I, I posit, plays a role in deriving the M form before enclitics. We attach our enclitic, we need morpheme initial consonants, we get a glottal stop word initially. The vowel features spread word medially. Uh, we want a crisp edge between the, the clitic host and the enclitic. So metathesis takes place. We've got our crisp edge. Uh, and now these features are spread across the intervening consonant. In this case, the consonant is specified as sort of minus everything. Minus, I've, minus, I've put minus C for minus consonantal there. Um, we're not allowed lines crossing, so that vowel gets deleted and then the previous vowel spreads. And we've got our M form before vowel initial enclitics. And this works for all the different word forms. So there they are on the right. We attach our enclitic. We can fill our empty C slots with the null sign to make it explicit that these behave the same as full consonants. Consonant insertion occurs, uh, metathesis occurs to give us a crisp edge, uh, vowel assimilation occurs because the blue consonants are sort of, the, sorry, the green segments are sharing features across the intervening blue ones. So those vowels get deleted, the other ones spread. We're not allowed three vowels, so in the form for beetle, the third vowel gets deleted. And then we've got our final R assimilation, which occurs in M forms. And we're done. So phonological metathesis, we've got a number of different processes associated with metathesis. And all these are analyzable as due to sort of automatic, uh, due to the phonological, env phonological environment in which they occur. Uh, consonant insertion, morphemes in an onset consonant, consonant, metathesis, Due to crisp edge, you want to keep those two morphemes separate, and that's because they form different syntactic heads. Okay, so then the syntactic structure is sort of having an effect on the phonological structure, then vowel assimilation because of metathesis. So the metathesis element of, of this is syntactically driven. It's because your sort of determiner is ahead of a determiner phrase, your noun ahead of a noun phrase, but it's phonologically conditioned. Before consonant initial enclitics, you don't have any of these processes happening. We also have a morphological process of metathesis, uh, which is the only signal of syntactic structure. Uh, here's two nearly identical sentences in Amarasi. We've got fatu ko'u and fault ko'u, which differ only in the in the form of the first, uh, first noun, and they have different structures. The form with the U form, we've got two noun phrases. The form with the M form, we've got a single noun phrase. Um, I should say that there's no evidence for a distinction between adjectives and nouns in Amarasi, so just analyze them all as nominals. So in the syntax, uh, metathesis is a kind of construct form. Uh, this is common in, in Arabic uh, dialects when you've got an attributive modifier, you mark it morpho morphologically in some way. This is what metathesis is doing in Amarasi. 
Um, yeah. Here's the extended nominal phrase that I propose for Amorasi. And this is where metathesis happens, within the noun phrase. If you've got an attributive modifier here, then the head will be in the M form. Modifiers, numbers, determinants, quantifiers don't trigger metathesis. Similarly, possessors don't, un don't experience, undergo metathesis uh, because of the possessor. It's only within, within the noun phrase, N bar. Also for verbs, the same thing. This is in serial verb constructions. Analyze serial verb constructions as being a kind of um, being of the same structure, but in the verb phrase. Uh, but let's talk about the noun phrase first. Uh, here's a sort of real life textual examples example. Uh, this is from a text where someone's describing how you can make a magical sign to protect your garden from theft. So he starts off. Bakesoko Nertani, you tie a rope. What kind of rope? Natutaintuni. It's a rope made from the Gewang palm. So our compound there, well, is it a compound? Is it a I'll be I'll remain agnostic. It has this structure. We've got two nouns within a single noun phrase, so the head noun occurs in the M form. Uh, and we can't have the U form here. Tani Tuni is nonsensical. That would mean something like ropes are gaywang palms. Um, doesn't make sense. Also, multiple modifiers. So every modifier, so, sorry, every noun except the final one will occur in the M form. So here we've got another example from a text. I'll talk about meal pren abit, inhabitant field work. It's sort of a ma inhabitant field work. With this structure, sort of happily branching up, and all the non-final nominals are in the M form. Also, if we have uh, an alternate structure where we've got two nouns here, modifying the head noun, uh, the, same, the same thing happens. So, So when you think about this, you're a person who's an evildoer. So it's, this is... Uh, a, a how does it work? It's a um, evil doer person, something like that. So anyway, this, this is how I analyze the structure, and this noun is in the M form because of this following one. This one's in the M form because of the following enclitic, and then this complex noun phrase uh, or compound modifies that noun, and so they're all in the M form. Yeah, so in the syntax, uh, M forms are a kind of construct form, marking a following attributive modifier of the same word class as the head. This contrasts with possession. So here's a typical possessive phrase in Amorasi, a thoni intani, a person's rope. Uh, here's the structure. We've got our possessor, we've got this optional possessive pronoun, and then we've got the possessum. And you can't have any of these elements metathesized. That's ungrammatical. Um, and this possessive pronoun is optional. So that can be deleted. A tonitani is also uh, completely grammatical. And so then this contrasts with taintuni. Uh, the only difference between the possessive phrase and the uh, modified and the attributive phrase is the metathesis of the initial noun. They have the same stress, same intonation, only the metathesis is signal, signaling the difference in syntactic structure. Another example in which it's only the metathesis which could be doing it is ordinal and cardinal numbers. So car uh, ordinal numbers are a kind of noun, cardinal numbers are not. So ordinal numbers occur within the noun phrase, so we get metathesis on the head noun. Uh, cardinal numbers occur outside the noun phrase and so we don't have metathesis on the noun. Again, these have the same, same stress, same intonation. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is where cardinal numbers are and ordinal numbers are down here. Uh, also in serial verb constructions, we have one verb modifying another, so the first verb occurs in the M form. 
Here's another example. This came from the end of a text where uh, my informant had been recording some stories and then the guy who was telling the stories and my informant, they both needed to use the bathroom, so they left. But he'd left the recorder on the table and so the other people were sort of sitting around and they're trying to turn off the voice recorder. Uh, and this one guy's trying to turn it off but he doesn't know what he's doing, so this other guy, his friend, sort of reprimands him and says, you're just nen mutafi vesina, and you're just pressing the buttons of that randomly. And he goes on to say, just like you do with all those mobile phones that you don't understand. Yeah. So here, the uh, serial verb construction is, uh, is signaled by the, the first verb occurring in the M form. So we've got the same sort of structure as our noun phrase, just four verbs. Yeah. Yeah. So within the syntax, uh, metathesis marks a kind of construct form. Now, you never get an M form in the syntax without some following U form. So when you get an M form, it's sort of somewhere not, it's sort of towards the beginning of the noun phrase. You might have a string of M forms, and then this U form will close, them, close it up and say, well, that's, that, that phrase is done. Uh, so we can analyze the M forms and the U forms as sort of forming a complete whole. A U form by itself is sufficient, but an M form by itself is not. It's sort of incomplete and needs a U form to be finished. Discourse metathesis. Now, discourse metathesis, so syntactic metathesis, that affects both nouns and verbs. Um, discourse metathesis affects a, a wide variety of um, word classes, uh, but most of my examples are of verbs, because that's where it's most prominent, okay? And before, yeah, so for verbs, the M form is the default form, okay? So if you get a word list, all the verbs will occur in the metathesized form. So the, that's the citation form. And this is different to nouns, where they occur in the U form. So for instance, this, this verb for to elbow someone, that will be cited as siu, elbows, whereas the noun will be cited as siuf. Okay? So we've got a difference in which morphological form is, doing, is marking which semantics. So for nominals, the U form is the semantically unmarked form. For verbs, the M form, which is the morphologically marked form, is the semantically unmarked form. And then the M form for nominals signals the marked semantics, construct form. And the U form for verbs signals some kind of special discourse semantics. So what is this sort of special semantics? It's unresolved. So when you get a verbal U form, it signals there's more coming. Um, this is a sort of extract from my thesis. So verbal U forms are used by speakers to signal that they do not consider the event or situation encoded by the verb resolved. So verbal U forms leave the audience in a state of mild suspense with the speaker signaling there's more coming. Uh, so if you use a U form, you're saying, you know, hold on to your seats, there's more coming. And there's a number of constructions in which these typically occur. One is in coordination. So you have one event in the U form, a coordinator, and then a following event which is dependent on that one. So you've got a sequence of events. So this is from a text about the creation of the world. There was a sort of mythical snake um, who created the world and he makes and goes out to, onto the dry land. So here the making is only one part of a more complex series of events. Um, and you can't have the M form here. I've tested this uh, with speakers and it doesn't make sense. It's nonsensical. Um, so we've got one event in the U form with an optional uh, coordinator and then a second event. And both these events then make up a whole sort of complex event. But it's not simply the case that it's some sort of morphological conditioning that you know, these uh, coordinators require an unmetathesized form because we can get the, the M forms before them. So here we've got 
Femnaise nasun man moi on reia. So the old woman spun thread doing it like this. Now here, the event on either side of the coordinator refers to the same event. The second verb is anaphoric reference to the first. Yeah. So another construction in which these typical occur, typically occur is in tailhead linkage. So here's another example from a text when it's partway through a text and me and Roni, my main informant, had been uh, going around to various places and we finished up at one place and we're going somewhere else. So he says, on the way while we were going, Owen in a piuren mouth. Owen's handkerchief fell. Mofum nam neuk. It fell and was lost. So this is a sort of critical point in the story um, when I lose my handkerchief. So here we've got my handkerchief fall. It fell. You form. That's not all. It was lost. And you can't just sort of have whatever form here. Having two U forms here doesn't make sense because that would be like it fell. That's not all. It fell. You know, it's. What's the new information? Um, and you can't have the M form here either. That's also not okay. You also get these U forms in speaker to speaker interaction, so in conversation. So U forms are typically questions. So this question, Homo Vei, this is the question I got asked whenever I did anything involving physical labor in the village. Um, and the canonical response is, Au Vei, yes, I can. So here we've got a U form. Can you do it? And then the other speaker provides the resolution to that U form. Here's an example from a text where they're talking about weaving, and one speaker asks, Hetfutu, do we tie it? And the other says, Tfut, remuti reia. Yeah, the white thread goes here. Also, more generally, not just in question answer pairs, but just to carry a conversation forward. So here's an interaction that I had in the village. I was sitting around with some, some guys, and this other speaker came up to me, and he asked me, Homun sa? And I said, I'll talk. I'm sitting. And then he said, Hom toko. So you're sitting, are you? And I wasn't very fluent at this point, so I didn't really know what to say. I just sort of continued sitting. But that wasn't enough. So then speaker A came forward, and he starts offering betel nut to the group. Betel nut is the sort of canonical activity of social interaction in Timor. So here we have this U form. It's kind of like a rhetorical question. I wasn't fluent enough to resolve it, so that guy then did. He didn't just sort of end the conversation and walk off to the garden. He kept on interacting. So this is signaling, I want to keep on, I want to keep on talking. We're not finished. Uh, here's a sort of longer example about a car which came off the road and it crashed. We have one speaker, so there will be a number of uh, letters here, and they're different speakers. He's discussing what happened. He forced himself and tried to reverse. Then he gets interrupted. He was firmly stuck, and there's this U form here. Then another speaker makes a contribution. Yeah, he would have wanted to shrink the car, make it smaller. U form. Then another speaker makes a contribution. They said the car was on the slope. You said, what, what's it? It was on the slope. No U form, but that speaker's not done. Uh, it fell straight through, and then they got it upright. U form, and then another speaker, speaker B again, and then suddenly this one, it fell. So here we have a number of changes of speaker, and each change of speaker is initiated by a U form in the previous sentence. The only one which isn't is the first one, and that guy got interrupted. So he wasn't finished, but someone just interrupted. So these U forms signal, you know, yeah, let's keep talking. You know, this isn't finished. And I did a bit of uh, counting. I've got three hours of glossed texts. Two and a half hours are monologues, so just someone telling a story. And then there's half an hour of conversations. And in the monologues, we have about one and a half U forms every minute. And in the conversations, we have two and three quarters U form every minute. So this is because there's more reason to have a U-form. In a monologue, it'll occur if you've got sort of a series of events. In conversations, it'll occur when you've got that and also when you're wanting to, you know, pass the conversational turn over to another speaker.
So in the discourse, our U forms are incomplete. They signal that it's not finished. And our M forms finish it off. So a U form says, we're not done. And then the M form says, OK, now we might be done. So some conclusions. Um, yeah, first of all, metathesis within linguistics. So far, people who've analyzed metathesis have mainly looked at the phonology. They've you know, come up with ways to explain why metathesis happens. Um, but in Amarasi, we also have to, we have to deal with the phonology in a big way. But we also have to understand the morphology, the syntax, and the discourse. If you were to sort of just look at metathesis phonologically in Amarasi, you'd miss a lot. Um, and I think that, you know, you know, we've got morphological metathesis in Amarasi. And this is sort of like a bridge between the phonology and the syntax and the discourse. We've got the phonological representation of syntactic structure with a, morpho with a morphological operation, metathesis. So that's metathesis within linguistics. So now sort of within Timor and then more generally. So here are our varieties of Wabmeto. Here's Amarasi. If you ask a speaker of any of these varieties what language they speak, they'll say that they speak Wabmeto or Darwan or Timorese. They identify it as a single language. And then if you dig a bit, bit deeper, yeah, okay, but what variety of Wabmeto, they'll typically give you one of these names. Now the borders of these different varieties are almost identical to the pre-colonial princedoms of the region. The only difference is is sort of down here, which represents a later migration from the north, and then Kusamanea, which was part of the Tetun speaking Wehali kingdom. Um, so we've got you know, a fairly complex situation. We've got some borders which represent some social reality, but not linguistic reality. And people care about these identities in a big way, okay? So here are three varieties of Wabmeto, Amarasi, Raikeno, which is in the north, and then Fatuleu in the northeast. And they've all got different cloth designs, okay? Um, so this is one way to express your identity, is to wear the cloth. And this cloth is sort of specific to the village and the hamlet. So this Amarasi cloth with the blue stripes, that's specific to Koro'oto hamlet, where I was doing my field work. And I imagine that the Fatuleu cloth is also specific to, I think it was Bineon, I can't remember the exact hamlet, Bineon Koa, and similarly the Vaikano. And each of these varieties has slightly different permutations on realizing their U forms and their M forms. So in Amarasi, the word for three, Tenu, Theon, we just have simple metathesis. In Vaikano, we have metathesis with complete vowel assimilation, Ten. In Fatuleu, we have metathesis, but we have a trace glide left, so you get ten. For the word for house in Amarasi, we have mid vowels being raised to high after a high vowel. In Vaikeno, that doesn't happen, so we get ume, uem. Fatuleu, I don't have the data. I want to know. Uh, the word for fire, which ends in a vowel sequence in Amarasi, doesn't distinguish between the U form and the M form. In Vaikeno, the U form is marked by that consonant insertion, which in Amarasi only happened before vowel initial and clitics. So, aids, ai. In Fatuleu, we also have that consonant insertion, but we also have the vowel assimilation, which we saw in Amarasi. Then the word for, for tree or wood, no difference in Amarasi. But now Fatuleu and Vaikano are the same. So depending on which consonant is inserted, you get different degrees of vowel assimilation. So here's a, a table of, uh, what, seven varieties of Wabmeto and two other languages of, of Timor. This is a Rotanese language and then Tetun in the east. And the U forms and M forms. So the U form of three is the same in all varieties. But then having an M form distinguishes Wabmeto speakers from, from the Rote speakers and Teton. But then within the M forms, there are differences. So Amarasi and Amanuban are the same. Um, for An, we have obligatory vowel assimilation. Timaus and Fatuleu, we have vowel assimilation with the trace glide. And then Vaikeno and Kopas, well, they can be the same as Amarasi, or they, they can be the same as Amfo'an. 
they've got a different form. It would be interesting to know, you know, what does a Vicano speaker say when they're speaking to an Amarasi person? And then what do they say when they're speaking to an Amfo'an person? For house, most varieties have the U form the same. But then Amfo'an and Timaus have consonant insertion. In Amfo'an we just have consonant insertion, L, Umel. Timaus we have consonant insertion and a change in the vowel. And then for our M form, Amarasi has vowel metathesis and vowel assimilation. Amanuban and Vikano have metathesis but no vowel assimilation. And then Amfo'an and Timaus just don't have the consonant insertion. For tree, well, Amarasi and Amanuban have the same U form. Now, Vikano and Fatuleu, they have the same form. They insert a B. Amfo'an inserts a G, Haug. Timaus inserts a, a J and assimilates the vowel. And Kopas inserts a G like Amfo'an but assimilates the vowel. And then they've all got the same M form, thankfully. The U form, again, Amarasi and Amanuban go together. But now Vikano and Amfo'an go together. They both insert J without vowel assimilation. Timaus is off doing its own thing with R. And then Fatuleu and Kopas pattern together. And then the M form is the same. So this variation is very complex and very subtle. It depends on what word class you have. So you've got um, a numeral here, which behaves differently to a noun, and the phonota phonotactic stra uh, structure of the words, the words which end in a vowel, uh, sequence of vowels, behave differently. And this stuff is it's very hard to do, for speakers to do. So with the cloth, you know, you can just borrow your friend's cloth and then identify as an Amarasi person. But this stuff is really hard. And I've listened to speakers, you know, from Amanuban in Amarasi trying to, you know, do this, and they can't do it right. They sort of try, but it's not quite right. Similarly, when I was with Roni, my main Amarasi informant, he took me to some friends of his who spoke Timaus, Fatuleu, and Kopas. Afterwards, we were talking about it, and he was saying, yeah, they, they speak differently. And then he tried to copy the kind of metathesis, the M forms that they were doing, but he wasn't getting it right. He was sort of guessing. So he was getting you know, the wrong consonant insertions. He knew that it was different, but not how, even though the patterns are regular. You know, it's just, it's difficult. OK, now metathesis and parallelism. So this is my syntactic metathesis. We've got these two parts that make a whole. And then with the discourse, we've got the mirror image. Now, parallelism is a big deal in the Timor region. Uh, Jim, James Fox, an anthropologist at ANU, has written a lot about poetic parallelism in the Timor region. The way you do poetry in this region is you say the same thing twice with near synonyms. So here's a extract from an Amanuban text in Wab Meto. Um, and we've got these parallelisms. So this land is very thin and very confined. Later we will eat badly and drink poorly. Uh, so be it, we will go to the wide stile and the wide gate, the rock of Tumbesi, the tree of Tumbesi. So to sort of uh, construct poetry, or really just beautiful speech, you use these synonyms or near synonyms. Here's an example from Amarasi. This is a prayer, um, a prayer that you pray when they bring the offertory forward in church. So he starts off, Our loving and generous Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, the living sacrifice, we give and give you these sacrifices. With two different words for give, this is sort of hand, to give with the hands, and the other one's the more general word for give, which we received and received from your loving hand. Here we've got um, the word for receive in a neighbouring dialect. So that's one way to form your parallel pair, is to borrow a, a neighbouring dialect's form or to use the Indonesian form. It's not great, but insignificance, and filled with filth and dirt, uh, but we bring them to you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. But we've also got here, with this verb, we've got our semantic or lexical parallelism, but we've also got morphological parallelism with our U form and M form. And this is common in poetry. 
Speakers will do this. They'll not only pair the lexical forms together, but they'll also give them complementary U forms and M forms. This is like a double parallelism. There's sort of, at multiple levels, it's parallel. Now, there was, um, yeah, so parallel pairs and complementarity are a big deal in West Timor. Schulte Nordholt was an anthropologist in the 70s. He was writing about the political structure of Wabmeto. Um, and he provides a table of complementary and parallel pairs of which I've adapted here. So we have things like feminine, masculine, wife, husband, inside, outside. So each of these forms one half of a whole. Uh, the one which is probably the biggest deal is the feminine-masculine pair. And this occurs in marriage. So here we have a wedding taking place, and this is in a village to the south of the one where I worked, which is why they've got the, the yellow lines rather than the blue. So we've got the groom here and the bride. And when two families are sort of... Uh, uh, when, when a couple gets married, the two families have now a different social relationship. Now let me get this right, because it's sort of, sort of complex. So in the kinship system, this is a, a quote from Schulte Nordholt, the feminine masculine relationship is found to exist between two houses which are allied by affinal relationships, so in law relationships. The house with which the natal house has affinal relationships via its daughters is called feminine. Okay? So if you've given your daughter in marriage, or is it if you've. The, and the one which is. So it has such relationships with its sons is masculine. Okay, here we are. In other words, the feminine house receiving a woman who is the source of life is inferior in respect to the one which is the giver of life and hence it's superior. Okay, so if you've given your daughter in marriage, then I think you're feminine in relationship to the other house, but you've also got a slightly superior relationship because the woman's the source of life, it's sort of a greater sacrifice to give your daughter, and if you've given your son, then you're masculine in relationship. So there's this complementary relationship because, as Schulte Nordholt goes on to say, but at the same time, the feminine-masculine relationship indicates that one cannot exist with other, as life is impossible without the unity of male and female. So you need both, but it's not, um, what's the word, it's not equal. There's a sort of, there's a complementarity there. Uh, precedence is the word that the anthropologists use to describe this. Uh, so we have our feminine form, which is sort of pre uh, in precedence to our masculine form. We need both, okay? Both are one half of a whole. Um, this is how it works in marriage, but in other relationships, you can also have feminine masculine relationship, and it can be different. So in the traditional political structure of Wabmeto, you had two, two rulers. One was a masculine ruler and the other was a feminine ruler. Both were biologically male and they had complementary roles. So the masculine ruler, he had the executive authority and was in charge of warfare. And the feminine ruler, he was in charge of maintaining ritual. Okay? Um, and so here it's not so much you know, which one is, is superior to the other. You just need both for society to function properly. Um, and you also have this with like inside and outside. So the feminine ruler is located in the inside of, you know, conceptually in the inside of the domain. Um, and then you have the outside, which is sort of inferior. So this is like my metathesis. We've got these two forms, which you need both of, and they're complementary. And here the M form doesn't occur without the U form. There the U form doesn't occur without the M form. So we've got this parallelism in the syntax and this parallelism and complementarity in the discourse. But we've also got parallelism between the syntax and the discourse, okay? Because of this flip-flop. So what we've got is something like this. This is our syntactic metathesis, or M forms and our discourse M forms. And in the syntax, the M form is complemented by the U form, which in turn is 
paralleled by an M form in the discourse, which is complemented by a U form, and so on forever. And once I apply the colors, that's the end of my seminar. So the end. I would say it's more maybe on the intonational level of awareness, okay? So people don't realize necessarily uh, that it's happening. So if you draw this to speakers' attention, like fatu fa, they're like, oh yeah, they are different. I hadn't really thought about it. Um, and, then, and then, yeah, some speakers are sort of more aware that it's different and others are less. So there's, there's varying levels of awareness, but it's more on the unconscious level. They can't sort of tell you, oh yeah, you know, those people metathesize differently to us. They're sort of aware that they have metathesis and that they're different from, you know, the Rotanese or whatever, but they're not quite sure yet. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I thought the, uh, the discourse uh, stuff was really, really funky. Mm. That, that was really cool. And so, have you seen this happening elsewhere then in the senior world? Um, the discourse, yeah, yeah, the discourse stuff, no, because partly we don't have very detailed descriptions of a lot of the languages. And to get this sort of high level discourse stuff, you really need to, you know, go through texts, you know, at a, at a serious level. The syntactic stuff, there are parallels um, in other languages, but they mark it differently. So in, um, let me bring up my map. So in Rote languages, they sort of mark the same similar syntactic structures, it seems, but they do it by just deleting a consonant. Then in Fataluku, which is a non-Austronesian language, there's some sort of uh, stress thing going on as well. And then Mumbai, they have, uh, they have metathesis as well. Okay. Those two. Yeah, Leti, yeah, that's right, Leti and Luang Du as well. There you get sort of, you know, a noun and, an, oh, and a modifier and they sort of metathesize around one another. Um, and there's other things going on like, you know, vowel deletion. Yeah. So discourse, I don't know. Yeah. Um, you told us some really mixed stuff about conversation in terms of yeah. um, turn taking and so on. Yeah. Just thinking about narrative, um, M in a way um, is always going to be a U if there's a, one of these clitics that yep. that mark. Yep. So do they have a distribution in like paragraph structure or something? They do. Right. They do. So. Um, so yes, so you get these, these M forms, which are an M form because of an enclitic. And then, so what you get is you get pairs uh, for nouns in particular, because the clitic marks definiteness. So you'll have a noun introduced and it's in the U form. Then when it gets repeated, it's now definite, so it's in the M form. And you have these pairs going on, particularly with the nouns. So you know, there was, you know, like in English, there was a dog the dog's name, you know, and you have these, so you have the same sort of, the same sort of thing going on, and then with the, um, 
the verbs as well. Um, Coding things like inceptive and... Yeah. Sort of yeah, so you can get these um, M forms, which are M forms, you know, at, a, at one level, purely because of the enclitic, right. then pairing with a U form as well. So you've got sort of multiple strategies to, like, get things in different orders. So, in fact, your circles are actually within a bigger circle. Yeah, there's circles within circles. Um, yeah, so, so typically in a narrative, um, your U form will precede your M form, yeah. except if you've got an enclitic, and then you can flip it around, right? right. And the U form is when you've got a conversation, basically saying, yeah. you take the floor. You go, you go now. Yeah. Yeah. Really, is there a start reason why you get this germ in blood as the magically appearing constant? Yeah. So that's actually um, it's a so so I so you know they don't there's no obvious explanation for where they come from. Um, in some varieties, you don't get a gwa, you get a burr. Okay, you know, similar sort of articulatory features, but that's a sort of a bit of a mystery to me, like where they come from. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah. You don't have Singapore on your map. I don't have Singapore on my map. <laughs> Why do you want Singapore on your map? I don't think. Okay, is this a map? I'm not which which section of the map? In the large scale map. Here. Yeah. Yeah, Malaysia, Malaysia, Brunei, oh, I haven't marked. Yeah, okay. So, so this, so this is the fault the of Philippines. Yeah, and I also Palau. I think Palau is there. Yeah. So I, so you know, I, I could dissuade. You know, uh, say it's not my responsibility, but because you know the ANU Carter GIS unit made it, but I can add Singapore in, and and Palau, and you know, PNG. And, and Thailand. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, no, no, it's, no, I'm not actually a serious comment. Yeah. That was Sir Penn's next question is why isn't Thailand? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this must drive OT, uh, OT uh, specialists crazy because you're violating faithfulness constraints all over the place. I mean, you're violating faithfulness all over the place. Well, I actually had a question about the interdialectal variation. Oh, yeah. Throw up that table with the co nice colours you have. What strikes me as kind of remarkable here is that your the forms which are phonologically, if I if I remembered you correctly, the forms which are phonologically marked. Yep. Are actually the unmarked. Yep. Uh, ones. Yep. And the ones which are phonologically unmarked are yeah, marked like, ones. Yeah, yeah, these ones. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so particularly the tree of <coughs> fire. Yeah. Which is a reversal of what you've got in the... Um, so, so somehow there's a mismatch between the function, the, the markedness uh, functionally, which you told us has to do with morphology and syntax and discourse. Yeah, yeah. And the phonology, which is, yep. uh, I mean, it, it works neatly in Amarasi, but it doesn't work. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, ones. that's right. If you if you go to, you know, Amphoran or something, yeah. Because right. you've got this sort of mismatch in Amarasi between the nouns and the verbs, right. but then you've got it for some of the nouns as well for other varieties. But then... Do you get similar things with the verbs that there's... Um, in the other, in the other um, varieties that you... Yeah. There isn't a nice, neat thing of saying all, you know, marked verbs are going to be phonologically yeah. marked or whatever. Yeah, depending on the phonotactic structure, I think you do. I have less data on verbs because it's sort of harder to get on that, you know, by spending a day in a village. But, yeah. Again, I... I mean, I'm not an OT specialist, but I would think that would actually strike them as very weird that you yeah. that you're actually violating faithfulness <coughs> in the unmarked situation, and you're not violating it in the marked situation. And but then you're doing different things, and it's just yeah. 
it's sort of like um because i don't do ot either but from a sort of ot perspective it's sort of like you're putting out one fire here but that just you know creates a flood so you need to do something yeah. and sort of as you're constantly doing things it's sort of scrambling to try and get something sensible as an output yeah mm. Well, you, it seemed like your hard edge constraint that you were mm. positing could be seen as an OT thing, but actually the rest of it doesn't, it just doesn't hang together. Yeah, so I sort of use some of this OT sort of language, yeah, but... I saw the capital letters. That's right, but I don't actually do the OT because, you know... Well, it won't work, I think, so... Yeah. You have to have very sort of finely balanced sort of constraints. Yeah. yeah. This this Timaus variety is the sort of the real weirdo, um, because after an U you get J inserted, mm. so like it's the data isn't here, but like Asul dog you'll get Asid, um, which is sort of I, I just don't know what happened there, and then they've got this R as what they've turned the J, J into an R. It's just a mess. You know, historically, it sort of makes sense if you sort of compare it to the un for un, but anyway, yeah. yeah. I, I was in the... Sort of learning this would be weird because yeah. it means in, that, in those varieties, if you have words like tree or fire, you actually never know what the un, unmarked form is unless you get an adjective or something. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Do they borrow words from... English or other dominant languages? Indonesian. Indonesian is the main one. Yeah, so they enter into the system. Um, so, so I should say in Amarasi, they sort of also do the metathesis. There's a couple of constraints. So if you borrow a consonant final word, like, uh, I can't think, like motor, motorbike, then that won't do the metathesis in the same way. Because that would end up, I, I think, in my sort of thinking, because then you delete the final constant, you get morph or something, and it's just unclear, you know. It's not a very high, it's not unclear what it is. But, uh, you know, a word final, consonant, fi uh, vowel final word, or before an enclitic will, even if it's phonologically unassimilated. So Amarasi has no D and no L, but a word like Dusun, which is an administrative level within Indonesia, you'll get Dusne, you'll get that metathesizing. And even like Kapala Desa, which is the village chief in Indonesia, that comes out as Kapal Desa, with the, the first element metathesized. So they're sort of borrowing the whole phrase of a noun and another noun, and then analysing it, and then putting the first one in the M form, even though it doesn't, it's not been phonologically assimilated. And do you have any data which about lines which involve vowel alternations? So you took the CV flipping around, but you know, these vowel neutralizations that you gave us examples of, would that also apply in low I mean, maybe the data's not there. I'm not, I'm not I don't, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of any examples. But yeah. Yeah. And I, and I seem to remember being slightly inconsistent with some of them. So sometimes you'll get this vowel assimilation and consonant insertion, other times they, they just won't. Yeah. Okay, well I think we'll let you off the hook. Yeah. Go for a drink. Yeah.